Hello, my name is Edward Dory, and my presentation is about morality and virtue, especially in relation to the works of the late Roman scholar St. Augustine and the medieval scholars Thomas Aquinas and Roger Bacon. Before we continue on, I would like to note that my in the world example of morality and virtue in rhetoric includes slut shaming, intellectual humiliation, suicidal encouragement, and homophobia. So please be careful if you find these topics too personal. To discuss morality and virtue and their associations with rhetoric and the work of these aforementioned scholars, it is best to explain the work of scholars that came even before these ones. So first off, let's talk, let's start with Plato. Plato's dialogue, Gorgias, reveals Plato's extremely negative conceptions about rhetoric. In the Platonic dialogue, Plato speaks through Socrates, and Socrates condemns, often through questioning, Gorgias's, a rhetorician's, conceptions of rhetoric. In one notable scene, Socrates asks if rhetoric can give knowledge about a topic, to which Gorgias responds, no. Socrates gives Gorgias a proposition, quote, shall we then assume two sorts of persuasion, one which is a source of belief without knowledge, as the other is of knowledge, end quote. Gorgias responds this proposition with, by all means. Socrates then says, quote, and which sort of persuasion does rhetoric create in courts of law and other assemblies about the just and unjust, the sort of persuasion which gives belief without knowledge, or that which gives knowledge, end quote. Gorgias responds to this question with, quote, clearly, Socrates, that which only gives belief, end quote. Socrates finally gives the assertion that, quote, and the rhetorician does not instruct the courts of law or other assemblies about things just and unjust, but he creates belief about them. For no one can be supposed to instruct such a vast multitude about such high matters in a short time, end quote. Gorgias merely agrees. In this dialogue, Plato implicitly reveals his belief that rhetoric, which he and the sophist Gorgias define as mostly objects to be used in the courts as secondary to one-on-one -on -one dialectic or an intimate philosophical back and forth. According to this dialogue, morality and virtue could not be attached to rhetoric as the goal of rhetoricians when giving talks about court cases in courts was merely to convince as quickly as possible the validity of the rhetorician's claims about the specifics of a case to a jury that was often not made up of especially well-educated people. Plato views rhetoric as an amoral act that exists almost exclusively to spread misinformation and belief rather than true knowledge about subjects. Aristotle takes a much more optimistic view of rhetoric because in his book Rhetoric, he emphasizes that the arguments of the rhetorician must have some basis in the truth to be convincing along with the established morality of the speaker and therefore malevolent use of rhetoric would often not be successful. Aristotle justified the use of rhetoric in the courts on the basis of practicality, noting, quote, for argument based on knowledge implies instruction, and there are people whom one cannot instruct, end quote. To simplify, some people, either due to time-based limitations or educational attainment, cannot be taught in a dialectical manner. Moreover, there is not always a teacher for every person in an, on a jury or among a group that must be tasked with making a decision, so rhetoric is morally acceptable to portray information to an audience. In addition, Aristotle notes that a speaker giving a speech is likely morally fine, because the statements of a speech often what Aristotle calls enthymemes, are based on likely truths and not unlikely truths, and the speaker must come across as if they are morally good to convince a jury of something. Aristotle says, quote, things that are true and things that are just have a natural tendency to prevail over their opposites, end quote, in reference to the fact that speakers, even if they don't give extremely in-depth and absolutely correct arguments, will still have to give out likely truths to convince someone of something in a rhetorical situation. The final influential figure before the main figures of my speech is Cicero, and he views rhetoric a lot like how Aristotle views it, but Cicero's words in support of rhetoric are even stronger. Through the figure Antonius, Cicero argues that all knowledge, even in rhetoric, is made up of predictable or likely figures that with study will be understood by a speaker quite easily. Antonius says, quote, all the possible subjects of debate are not founded on a countless host of human beings or an endless diversity of occasions, but on typical cases and characters, and that the types are but few, end quote. See page 302 of De Orator. The types or possibilities of an argument can be figured out through rigorous study, and even if the basis of a rhetorical argument is merely likely truths, Cicero notes that the validity of a speaker's claims are close enough to the truth to be morally acceptable. Cicero further emphasizes the morality of the rhetorician when he notes that the rhetorician or orator must go through rigorous training to even begin to create convincing arguments, comparing rhetoricians or orators directly to philosophers on page 249. Craig R. Smith in Rhetoric and Human Consciousness notes that the major philosophers who influenced St. Augustine were Plato and Cicero, not Aristotle. 
Fordham University adds on to Smith's assertions, stating that it wasn't until about 1245 that the scholars really began to, really to rediscover Aristotle. Nonetheless, St. Augustine's conceptions about the morality of rhetoric replicate aspects of Aristotle's views. Augustine specifically says that certain audiences are not competent enough to understand certain biblical passages in on-Christian doctrine, so those passages must be left out of preaching. Quote, for there are some passages which are not understood in their proper force, or are understood with great difficulty, at whatever length, however clearly, or with whatever elo eloquence the speaker may expound them, and these should never be brought before the people at all, end quote. Like Aristotle, Augustine thought that certain time-based or educational limitations would stall audiences from comprehending certain biblical passages, so it is best to use Aristotle's enthymemes, or likely ideas and propositions, that change the absolute form of the truth of scripture for certain audiences. Note, however, that according to Augustine, the, this non-scriptural style of teaching is still teaching the truth. It is simply refined truth. Augustine justifies what some would consider his proposed lack of truth in preaching by highlighting that true teaching comes in, quote, making clear what is obscure, end quote. Augustine makes teaching the merely probable morally fine. Unlike Cicero and even Aristotle to some extent, however, Augustine takes a much more negative view of the inherent morality of rhetoricians. Augustine notes that many speakers of rhetoric, although they may discuss the truth, actually are hypocrites. Augustine says, quote, it is the man who speaks well, but lives badly, who really takes the words that belong to another, end quote. Unlike Cicero, who notes that studying rhetoric, rhetoric and creating probable truths often leads to the moral growth of the rhetorician through the finding of the likely truth, and Aristotle's notation of rhetoric's acceptance deemed to be based on some amount of felt goodness, Augustine believes that some preachers are simply bad people. However, Augustine notes that one could be a hypocrite, but still give the truth by either stating biblical passages or decreasing the complexity of those passages for teaching. Thomas Aquinas and Roger Bacon lived around the time when Aristotle was being rediscovered. But their version of rhetoric, unlike Aristotle, seems to have more in common with Plato's dialectic, or absolute vision, of truth-telling and morality. When talking about preaching in Summa Theologiae, Aquinas emphasizes that it is the Bible that contains truth and is self-evident. He implies that if someone is not convinced of biblical scripture, then they simply cannot be convinced of the truth. In this way, the simplified version of the truth proper by Augustine's rhetoric is gone, replaced with the iteration of scripture to prove one's argument. Augustine says, quote, God, however, is truth itself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Therefore, God's existence is self-evident, end quote. Bacon is similar, emphasizing that the uneducated should not be appealed to, and that the scripture is often convincing on its own in his book, Opus Magis. But Bacon notes that beyond scripture, dialectical logic and not simplified truth can and should be used to convince non-believers. Quote, as the heathen do not accept this faith, we must challenge them on philosophical ground, end quote, page 178. Neither later theologians view audiences as, un as uneducable or unworthy of complex argument in the way that Augustine does. Now I will show how the rhetorical theories of Augustine, Aquinas, and Bacon work in the real world. This is, a, this is a letter given to Martin Luther King Jr. by the FBI according to the documentary MLK slash FBI. In the letter, the writer encourages King to kill himself. King was a preacher, and his conceptions about nonviolence partially come from his Christian upbringing. So pointing out King's inability to abide by Hebrews 13.4, 13, i.e., quote, let the marriage bread be undefiled, for God will judge the immoral and adulterous, end quote, should be a strong argument against King. It fits Augustine's condemnations of hypocrisy and unchristian doctrine. But one issue with the suicidal letter is that it doesn't include an overt mention of the biblical passage wherein adultery is stated to be wrong. The letter writer, who pretends to be black, argues against King's wrongdoing, wrongs, wrongdoings, and the writer, as Augustine recommends, does not use explicit scriptural reasoning or mentioning to explain why what King was doing was wrong, perhaps because the letter writer believes black people to be innately idiotic. It was the 60s. The Baconian and Aquinian use of explicit scripture or logical proposition is not done, and therefore does not abide by their ideas about morality and rhetoric. Further discussion about the letter lies in my discussions video.